<laughs> Yet I see now that I had some success even without the publication because it turned out that in these stories of mine, I was teaching myself what I needed to know for the poems I would eventually write. The stories, similar to my later poems, were lyrical or meditative narratives about the people I found around me, exploring their New England and American dimensions. And in my cartoons, I think I was trying out something like the lyrical narratives of my later verse, too. Going back to this example, creating a cartoon was a matter of bringing characters together and finding the exact words and tone of language in a brief caption that would, poof, bring their story to life. Besides, the cartoons gave me a way to explore two things that became important to my poetry later on, namely humor and the popular culture. Then, then a traumatic event happened to me and my family, and in the emotion of that event, I wrote a poem that made me put aside cartoons and short stories and return to poetry once and for all. This is the poem I mean called Leaving the Country House to the Landlord Five Years Later, I don't intend to examine this poem in any detail, so don't try to squint at the words here. Or I'll just say the event that inspired the poem, the traumatic event, was being evicted from a beloved rental house with only a month's notice by a landlord who moved into it on the very day we moved out, and what's more, cut down our favorite shade tree while we loaded our things into the truck. As it happened, Diane was pregnant with our fourth child at the time, and neither she nor I had a clue about where we'd go next. Leaving the country house to the landlord appeared in Poetry Northwest, and it was the first poem I ever published. And as I am trying to relate the story of a poet's life here, let me hold the slides for a minute and tell you what it was like to publish my first poem. This is a short passage from my prose book, Mapping the Heart. People who lived through the assassination of President Kennedy remember where they were when they got the news. I recall exactly where I was when I learned that my first poem had been accepted for publication. I was standing outside the post office in August 1968 near my in-law's camp in Enfield, New Hampshire, the only place my family and I could find to live that summer, my life in tatters. Too broke even to have my car aligned, I'd driven for weeks to a summer job on badly scalloped front tires. In short, things couldn't have been worse until I opened my letter of acceptance from Poetry Northwest. The steering wheel shaking in my hands, I drove all the way home, weeping and shouting, I found a form. Though I now see a certain awkwardness in the poem that once rescued me from my formless life, the moment I arrived in the doorway to share my good fortune with my wife Diana is still vivid and perfect in my mind. Eventually, I published not only a first poem, but a first book. And this is the galley copy of that book from my collection titled The Faces of Americans in 1853, published in 1984 by the University of Missouri Press as the Devons Award winner in that year. That's the good news. The bad news is that publishing this book took a very long time, and it took an even longer time to finish it. In fact, how I even completed this book, I do not know, because while I wrote it, I was also teaching, raising the four children with Diane, and piecing together graduate degrees. So it helped enormously in this period to have the encouraging letters of the poet Donald Hall, who, as luck would have it, just happened to live in my neighborhood. Here's his letterhead again, which is often repeated in my papers of the late 70s and 80s, and in fact turns up regularly in all the years since. I was introduced to Don and his wife Jane Kenyon in the early months of 1976 by two former students at his farmhouse, which was located 10 miles away from my own house in North Sutton, New Hampshire, hence the address below that letterhead. And at the end of my visit, I sheepishly drew a chapbook of poems out of my coat, put it on the kitchen table, and got out of there. But it turned out that Don liked the poems, and we began to visit each other and write back and forth about each other's work. I got the, back, the best of the correspondence, of course, because in the end, his advice helped shape me into a poet. I soon learned I could trust Don to say exactly what he meant, as here in this letter from the 21st of September, 1979, where he flays me about a particular word in a draft I've sent him. 
That's not his original letter, by the way. I photocopied it so I could circle a relevant passage in red ink. Here now, a detail from that letter. Can't you hear Bing Crosby singing this word of yours, yearning? It's Tin Pan Alley. And the word reminds me of the most prosperous poet ever to emerge from Tin Pan Alley, Rod McEwen. <laughs> Once, Don read an extensive and self-adoring biography I sent as a contributor's note to Poetry Magazine, and he wrote this. I think that the most effective kind of biographical note is something that is quite reticent, non-academic, and non-successful, like Wesley McNair lives in New Hampshire where he raises goats with eyes in the middle of their foreheads. <laughs> because I kept trying and failing to publish my first book year after year during this period, Many of Don's letters had words of support for that struggle. Like this one, the writing I don't need to tell you is what matters. Keep getting better and improve the manuscript every time it comes back and you will win through. Yet his most moving counsel is not an upbeat call to work, but the bittersweet commiseration in this letter dated July 8th, 1980, which mixes advice to me and my disappointment about not publishing a book with the disappointment he himself had begun to feel after publishing several. So I'd like to read with you the opening section of this letter. Believe me, I am sympathetic with your feelings, but let me tell you that when you published a book, which you will, nothing will happen, or at least it will seem that nothing has happened. And this would be true whether it were published by New Rivers or by Athenium. Even if something happens, then you realize that the something is truly nothing. And after you've published eight books of poems, you are still convinced that no one has read you and that probably you're, you are no good anyway. Or at least you are convinced of that frequently. I have been going through quite a bad patch in my feelings about my own ability, my past work, and certainly my present work. There is only one place or one moment in which one finds happiness, and it is always momentary because that is the moment of actual writing, and of course that is not always true. So I do two things. I assure you that you will publish, and I tell you that it will not make any difference. But I have a third thing to say. It makes a difference to me. That letter, I don't need to tell you, is remarkably honest, true, and generous, and in just these ways, it's characteristic of the whole series of Hall letters I've tucked away from those early years to the present. My collection also contains notes and letters from Jane Kenyon, who supported me during this period by publishing my poems in a new journal of hers called Greenhouse. It's good, and I want to put it in the winter issue. How many more do you have in your drawer? 